I have more questions uh, to ask. <laughs> absolutely. So we are thinking about ventilating these sick patients. What do you think is the usual challenges that you are uh, uh, coming up with ventilating these patients? And uh, what are the predictors you would find to understand who goes on to ventilation, who doesn't go on to ventilation? And do you have any uh, direction on that for us? Absolutely. So, so I think I think we'll start with understanding who should be tested. So the recommendations for who should be tested, first of all, you have to identify the positive people and then determine their course and who goes on to have further severe complicated disease versus mild, right? And so clinicians using their judgment, um, and this is these recommendations for testing both in India as well as the United States continue to evolve, although the ability to test here on a slightly larger scale with multiple organizations um, having their own testing uh, kits as well, such as Mayo, who's developed their own test, are also able to do it on a higher volume. Institutional guidelines have been established across the country here to help us with this. You have your I, own kit. Wait, one minute. Yeah, let me interrupt. You have your own kit. Um, we do. Is, so, that, oh, is, that, is that an RT-PCR or what is it? it uh, it is. So it's an RT-PCR for specifically for nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swabs. It has a very high specificity, uh, but I would like to highlight the important thing to remember uh, with the entire testing uh, realm of RT-PCR with these swabs is the sensitivity is only between 75 to 80%. So there are a lot of patients, if you don't have a sufficient enough viral load or you're testing very early in the disease within that viral shedding phase, you may not capture them, which is where we, leave, we end up with amazing CT findings that are very specific for COVID, but that RT-PCR keeps coming back negative where we do repeated testing for them. Yeah, and I've actually had a patient who came back positive after three swabs his fourth swab okay. came back positive okay. and so it's a very tricky situation at what point do you say oh yeah you're not you don't have the disease and then you let them out into the public and then they go on to infect other people right so if you're doing a bronchoscopy for the first time on a patient who's covid negative uh, you really don't know whether he's going to come back positive later so very true very, very true and since you bring up bronchoscopy, and I know that's your area of expertise, I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, let me tell you a little bit about our experience with uh, these kind of populations where the nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swabs are uh, insufficient samples or whether due to improper technique have not yielded a positive test. Um, we have been leaning more and more towards avoiding bronchoscopy and avoiding induced sputum uh, techniques to test uh, for the virus. The reason is because these are very high aerosol generating procedures. Now, let's say you think, okay, I want to do a bronchoscopy on a patient because he's having hemoptysis or you're trying to treat something else like severe mucus plugging or you suspect on a CT scan that there's an endobronchial lesion that needs evaluation. In the back of your mind, even if you have a high suspicion, you want to make sure you're protected. So use airborne isolation precautions and full PPE, which includes an N95 mask and a full face shield that covers the surface of this mask with full protective gown and glove technique to do the bronchoscopy. Uh, and when you are bro doing a broncos bronchoscopy procedure on patients who are intubated, ensure that the mechanical ventilation circuit has, an has a viral filter on it, which we will review a in a few slides going ahead. In addition, also ensure that you avoid bronchoscopy on patients who are not intubated because their cough reflex can be so strong that the aerosolization is much more significant. And um, I know we've talked a little bit about uh, how sick patients can get. And uh, you had asked me a question a couple of minutes ago before we got into the need for bronchoscopy was management strategies of these very critically ill patients in the ICU or within your hospital setting and then coming to your ICU being very, very sick. So management of hypoxia becomes the most 
key component of taking care of COVID patients. Uh, early recognition of hypoxia and looking at what these patients behave like becomes a very important piece of this. Um, identifying patients with high risk factors, like we reviewed earlier, using uh, a new score, which is an early warning score that was developed originally in the UK to predict patients who have higher risk of respiratory failure, uh, plays a key role in monitoring these patients while they're on a general medical floor. And then if you start seeing their new score rising, any scores greater than six to 12 in that range, predicts a higher risk of requiring non-invasive support or high flow oxygen support, and then progressing to mechanical in, uh, ventilation is a good way to approach these patients. Um, there are very, various other scores for these COVID patients that have been used uh, to sort of recognize the high risk population, although none of those scoring systems have truly been validated given how new this disease is. The new score, on the other hand, was originally devised just to look at all critical care patients within a hospital, and it has been validated. So we here have extrapolated some of these scoring systems to help our patients um, within the hospital. The degree of hypoxia, I want to highlight one more time. I know I'm saying this again and again, can be so different from what you see on a radiograph. So don't be fooled by a relatively normal chest X-ray. The other key component that is important to understand is the use of non-invasive ventilation or high flow nasal cannula or high flow oxygen support for these patients. Um, there have been guidelines from Australia and New Zealand that totally go completely against uh, using non-invasive or high flow. They recommend early recognition of hypoxia and early intubation of these patients. Uh, I know there is variable practice within many hospitals within the United States. However, um, at Mayo Clinic here, we have been using non-invasive ventilation and high flow nasal cannula with certain uh, parameters in mind. And non-invasive, if we use it as a ceiling treatment or in somebody who's relatively young, has good respiratory function in an otherwise normal state and can manage without, without intubation because intubation itself is not a benign procedure. It carries its own risks. So if you can avoid it in a young, otherwise healthy individual, we would like to try a non-invasive uh, strategy if possible. Um, where and how, because of the risk because of aerosolization. I can see over the uh, you know, uh, non invasive ventilator, or you know, what is the best way to usually oxygenate these patients because we're dealing with hypoxia here. So, mm -hmm. uh, has there been any study that shows you know, HFNC is preferred over the regular uh, bypass machine or uh, non invasive ventilation mode? Uh, that's, that's a great question. So, what we already know that to manage pure hypoxemic respiratory failure, when they compared the use of high flow nasal cannula to non-invasive, high flow was proven to be a slightly better modality. However, the given where obesity becomes one of the huge risk factors for COVID infections, um, if you see that there is a component of obstructive sleep apnea playing a role or obesity hypoventilation syndrome leading to a combination of hypercapnic and hypoxemic respiratory failure, I think non-invasive becomes a better modality to manage. High flow becomes a great modality when it's purely hypoxemic respiratory failure for symptom management. The other thing that we have noticed is that using the type of interface for non-invasive, whether it's CPAP or BiPAP, using a full face mask with a viral filter that I've indicated in this image right here, which is the same filter with an adapter that can be used on a mechanical ventilator as well as non-invasive, can reduce aerosolization. But any of the interfaces that use non-invasive require a really good seal because otherwise you're aerosolizing everything else and your humidification also carries these viral particles. And so that also can worsen uh, aerosolization. Let me, and uh, let me stick in that question here. Uh, do you guys really use nebulization still in your IC patient or you're resorting to using your meter dose? 
So that's, that's a great question. We had a lot of debate about this, even at our institution. We're using specialized nebulizer machines without the moisture uh, developing um, chamber, without the one that aerosolizes uh, free particles into the air. And we use it via a mouthpiece so that there's no, so it's a closed circuit with a mouthpiece for the nebulizer treatments with a viral filter on it as well. So it's got a viral filter on the expiratory limb. Okay. It has the medications in a chamber and a mouthpiece okay. without an open outlet for the chamber. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. And these viral uh, HME viral filters are fitted to all those, all the exhaust uh, systems within a non-invasive as well as within the high flow uh, chamber. So that way you prevent and reduce the amount of aerosol. But all that said, if some when they take off the mask and if they cough, it's still the same. So the risk with both non-invasive and high flow is fairly high. And so all providers and nurses who go into the room to take care of these patients wear full protective equipment. And basically, how are you guys triaging these patients? Uh, because now that you, you might have a COVID ICU or non-COVID ICU, I assume. Is that how you're managing your cases or yeah. uh, is there something else you're doing? Uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. So here at Mayo, we're very blessed to have about 12 different ICUs to handle um, everything ranging. And each individual ICU has its own very specialized uh, unit. So there's a medical ICU, which has 32 beds. There is a surgical trauma ICU with 32 beds. There's a cardiovascular surgery ICU, which handles ECMO and immediate post-op cardiovascular surgery with 32 beds. A specific cardiac ICU with, or again, 32 beds. So there's so many different areas where we can really con comfortably delineate as a COVID ICU, which has become mostly the medical ICU now. Uh, all intubated patients who, ha who are COVID positive are housed within the medical ICU. Yeah. We have an overflow system that we are using to also house patients in negative pressure rooms within some of the other ICUs, such as the trauma and the surgical ICUs. Yeah. But we're trying to geographically keep them contained also because that makes it easier for the providers who are caring for these patients. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Quite interesting. It is. And uh, I'm actually going back to the East Coast now that I've graduated from here. Uh, and I'm working, I'll be working at Yale again, where they had, um, it was a 650 bed hospital where at peak, they had greater than 350, 360 patients all at once. Yeah. And they had 78 intubated patients, yeah. uh, over 30 plus of whom were prone all at one time. If you took any point in time, that's how sick they were. And it was, it, the experience is something else. And it's a very- It's very humbling that, uh, Savita, that you're going back uh, to your alma and uh, going to be you know, doing service to these patients. It's quite humbling and I'm very proud. Oh, thank you. It is, it's, uh, it's very humbling to learn that this sort of thing can happen in our lifetime. And we're very privileged also to be able to care for them. And I'm very proud that you're doing it in Bangalore. I wish I could be there to help. Thanks. But, so I know you had mentioned a couple of uh, slides before you had asked me about mechanical ventilation in these patients. Again, it is very important to stress early recognition, keeping an eye out for any of these alarm symptoms that say, okay, you know what, there's something we're missing and maybe we should intubate this patient. And that's very important to know. And always having a astute clinical eye, which all of us do to do this. Um, one thing to remember between with intubation strategies is the actual act of intubating, because this is the most aerosol generating procedure there is within this uh, while caring for a COVID patient. So the core principles, again, to highlight, make sure you have your PPE right. There's no emergency. You can still make it. If it takes you two minutes, it takes you two minutes. Wear your gown, wear your mask, wear everything properly, then go into the room. 
maximum first pass success what do i mean by that so if you are a provider who's com- comfortable with a direct laryngoscopy and you know for a fact that this is somebody you can get a dl in in your first shot you're going to intubate them use that if you are somebody who's comfortable with a glide or the patient has a high risk airway with a bmi that's greater than 35 or they have a known prior difficult intubation and you need to use a glide use a glide use a glide scope first get it in things you want to avoid is avoid using thing uh, any sort of cough generating procedure while intubation so basically what do i mean by that paralyze all of them so use a rapid sequence intubation protocol for all these patients use a paralytic ensure complete action of a paralytic especially if you're using rocuronium give enough time for it to completely act before you try to intubate um use the most experienced clinician in the setting on the team to do the intubation okay have backup supplies within the room have a smaller et tube have a glide stylet have a glide scope ready you want to get it as quickly as you can and as efficiently as you can so here's a nice flow sheet that we have been using to um for the process of intubation itself the key thing to also remember is we always try to pre oxygenate our patient and we bag mask valve them and this is a very important thing to remember you don't always have to do it you can use apneic ventilation avoid uh, using breaths with the bag bag, bag valve mask if you are going to do that make sure your bvm has a viral filter on it so even if they cough the viral filter will hopefully capture whatever particles there are and you will prevent yourself from getting infected um apneic ventilation techniques have been well described especially in an or setting which can be extrapolated into an icu setting where you put them on 100% oxygen um through the pvm use a double handed seal and just hold it right there that itself using a nasopharyngeal opening and give them a good jaw thrust if you feel like they have a larger thick neck and are going to collapse on themselves apneic ventilation works great and then use your first pass okay. method whether it's a dl or a do you use some breathing as well at that moment i know there are many times where i take a deep breath and i hold <laughs> it as my patient's holding it <laughs> i've had a couple of patients where it has been very tricky and we've had to you know do a second pass and that's a very scary situation um and like i said again rsi paralyze and your first pass that has to be stressed the one other aspect i wanted to highlight right so now let now you've intubated the patient we've put them on a mechanical ventilator you have them on 6 to 8 cc per kilogram of ideal body weight lung protective ventilation you're still not able to get them to oxygenate better this is a very common scenario in these covid patients because they have such variable patterns of presentation of severe illness all the way from uh, somebody who has a very poor compliance versus someone with uh, high elastins and high compliance circuit the hnl types that we've talked about earlier we do all of that but i think uh, we're not going to dwell into those specifics no Yeah. but what i'd like to highlight is once you recognize that somebody has refractory hypoxemia despite keeping them on lung protective ventilation you want to try and increase the peep as much as you can and if you're not able to do so you increase the peep and you see that your plateau pressures are injurious um re- reassess your strategy perform a recruitment maneuver using the whatever ventilator you have and you can set the peep high for a few seconds from about 10 to 15 seconds see if your recruitable lung volume uh works and see if oxygenation improves if it does not improve you know initiate what we call here is a refractory hypoxemia protocol which involves um use of paralytic like cisatricurium or atricurium drips continuously use uh, and then decide if you're going to prone the patient so when do you prone the patient once you've optimized peep and done lung protective ventilation and they have a minimum moderate response to paralysis think about early proning the other thing that i wanted to highlight with early proning is that it's not just restricted for patients who are intubated and mechanically ventilated think about self proning as well and this is something we've been employing within our icu and there is currently a feasibility study that we are doing here at mayo clinic based off of 
two Chinese studies that came out a few months ago before the COVID era itself, where non-invasive and high flow patients who were self-proning had better response mm -hmm. with their hypoxemia. And this is something that we could use. Okay. And we had uh, you know, uh, infusion as well. And there are a lot of studies you know, substantiating that. And we do bedside proning for patients who have very early hypoxia. Mm -hmm. Just about entering into respiratory failure right in the ward. So the patient themselves, you know, prone and sleeps in different positions for some time. Exactly. And possibly that helps is what they believe. Exactly. And I have, uh, I've been taking care of a patient whose BMI is 35 and she's a young girl and she's, she's able to, she's strong enough where she can do it herself. So she goes on the prone position. We put her in reverse Trendelenburg. So basically still in prone, but head end elevated to offset the weight of an abdominal uh, component on her diaphragms. And it seems to help. Um, Again, these are all still anecdotal sort of experiential things that we are sharing in the medical world because this disease is so new and so severe. We are really struggling to find a happy ground here. Anything that helps. Definitely. Proning, I think, is one of the more approved techniques. So we, the way we prone is what we call a burrito method. There's multiple providers. There's one a respiratory therapist securing the ET tube at the head of the bed and we prone them with a whole team in the room so that the risk of self-extubation or uh, inadvertent extubations is much lower. Then what we do is pull them to the head of the bed and this is the key component here. We use a foam pillow with a little ridge where the ET tube can sit so that their neck and spine is at neutral position. And then again, same way as demonstrated in figure nine, we reverse channel and bug them and then optimize the ventilator. And now the almighty question of what to do with ECMO. The Chinese experiences in all their studies have also shown that ECMO has not been used as much in patients with severe ARDS from COVID-19. Uh, at Mayo here, our uh, inclusion criteria is uh, patients who have um, adults basically who are at high risk of death with conventional treatment. If they have a reversible injury or if we think that their trajectory can be really changed with ECMO um, and potentially, you know, other pulmonary hemorrhage or secondary pulmonary hemorrhage or something like that uh, also as their presenting illness and not just um, ARDS. So if there's combination of any of these, we have considered it. Absolute contraindications are if this is a terminal disease or if their expected length of survival is very low. If they have, if they don't have a neurologically intact um, a situation such as an anoxic brain injury or a cardiac arrest leading to that, an irreversible CBA, um, those are patients who we don't consider for ECMO. And this is a very generalized approach to ECMO that we have been using here. And this is sort of our guideline to get an ECMO evaluation from our uh, ECMO surgeons. The thing that I have at least noticed in the past few months with COVID is that we have had um, only two patients who have gone on ECMO with COVID. And those situations where one was a patient who had a traumatic intubation out in the field before being airlifted to us and had severe sub-Q emphysema uh, and huge pneumothoraces that really caused an obstructive shock like picture and needed to be support, circulatory support from ECMO, not necessarily only for oxygenation. Um, the other patient was just somebody who had very prolonged uh, intubation period with COVID and ended up on ECMO. And both patients have since been traked and are slowly recovering from oh, their- yes. uh, so Both the patients are doing well and they're almost- to the So road. far, yeah. They're actually still in the hospital. They've both been in the hospital for over six, six weeks period and one has been there I think for almost 10 week period yeah. yeah yeah so I mean I don't I think this is again an evolving area where there's lots to be learned but this is where where it stands currently are you using a lot of ECMO in your hospitals I think uh, for, with respect to COVID, uh, we mm -hmm. don't really want to use the ECMO as such uh, now because we don't mm -hmm. want to use ECMO for patients. 
uh, uh, and only we're just sticking to the routine ventilation protocols. Uh, but the mortality associated with ventilation itself in many yeah. places, especially Italy, and so is quite high. Uh, so we are uh, really wondering whether ECMO is going to do any good. So we're just waiting for you know some concrete evidence uh, mm -hmm. from the bigger institutes to see whether ECMO has a significant role to play uh, in this disease process. Yeah. Absolutely, and I think we are we are sort of working with the same. Um, in the same process. And I think that's been a world experience so far. And I think one of the things that we learned from some conversations with hospitals in New York, which has probably been the one concentrated area of such high burden of disease, was that healthcare centers get so overwhelmed when they come in such large numbers that ECMO is something that's a very resource intensive process. You need a perfusionist at the bedside all the time. Most often patients end up on continuous renal replacement therapy. Most often patients require so many medications and drips and utilization of healthcare resources that becomes very difficult to handle when you're in a pandemic high volume situation. And I suspect some of that is driving this, but I think there's a lot to be learned still in the COVID era. And I think this is going to continue. My prayer and my hopes are that a lot of them can be retrospective and we don't have to see too many more prospective cases. Exactly. Um, and we, we hope you find the solution. Uh, in the way I, I agree. So, I agree. So my next question to you, Kanta, is uh, we know that this COVID-19 uh, is turning out to be a hyper state. You know, and what really uh, are we looking at with consideration of anticoagulating these patients. Uh, what's the best way to anticoagulate these patients and reduce uh, the hypercoagulating state and the uh, consequences associated with it? Absolutely. And I think you're, you're very right. There is so much evidence that this is a microvascular endothelial injury situation leading to high amount of microthrombotic disease as well, which also interestingly has been described in earlier literature within just not a regular ARDS type of picture itself before the COVID era. So there was a LIPS-A trial where they tried to look at use of aspirin in ARDS patients, which was actually done uh, with PIs at Mayo Clinic as well, which didn't really show much benefit. So there isn't a particular strategy that is recommended by either the SCCM or the ATS and chest guidelines to say, okay, you're going to anticoagulate everybody. It has to be assessed on an individual case-by-case -case basis. And this is where a D-dimer utilization can come into effect. And uh, we assess uh, them based on an ad admission D-dimer, and then we track D-dimer over a period of time, obviously using clinical parameters to distinguish this. If they have uh, asymmetric uh, lower extremity swelling or any other suspicions for uh, a PE, if you're you know, suspicious of these things, then you can therapeutically anticoagulate them. But in the absence of a truly proven uh, thrombus by a DVT ultrasound scan or a CT chest angio, what we are utilizing is cutoffs on D-dimer, whether it's greater than 3,000 or less than 3,000 nanogram per, millimeter, per milliliter, as illustrated in this table right here, we're using either low molecular weight heparin, which uh, or untractionated heparin divided into weight-based doses. So if your D-dimer is greater than 3000 and you're critically ill and you're in the ICU and you're intubated and you're still having suspicions of this, I've had patients where I've had a D-dimer as high as 38,000. Somebody else I took care of had it in the 90,000 range, which is huge but had no evidence of a DVT on scans. So what do you do in those situations? It's very it is a very interesting aspect of this disease. Again, a lot of research is ongoing, but the risk of bleeding with therapeutic anticoagulation, targeting high anti-10A levels or targeting a very high APTT can also be harmful, right? Because they can develop brain bleeds. They can develop massive GI hemorrhage, which we saw in one of our patients who we put on therapeutic anticoagulation and he developed a pretty large GI bleed. So we're using weight-based um, and the distinction is with a weight greater than 120 kilograms or a BMI greater than 40. 
And if you have renal dysfunction or creatinine clearance less than 30, the preferable option would be using heparin subcutaneously, either BID or TID, depending on your weight. So would you like to tell us uh, something about the therapies that are available so far and a uh, few evidences that uh, they might have on uh, treating these patients in the ICU and antiviral therapy uh, and uh, so on? And again, an area that there's so much research going on, one of the most talked about therapies, as we all know, is remdesivir. And remdesivir has, interestingly, been approved within the US for uh, compassionate use exception as well. So the FDA has allotted certain amount of remdesivir availability to different hospitals across the country. So any hospital um, board of infectious disease specialists who determine the allocation of these drugs can approve it for any patient, even if they're not enrolled in a specific trial. The trials for remdesivir that we're looking at right now at the Mayo Clinic is five days therapy versus 10 days of therapy um, and monitoring their liver function tests very closely because it can cause significant LFT derangements as well as there have been reports of it causing acute interstitial nephritis in some of these patients. Um, the interesting findings is that there's been uh, some preliminary data that came out just last week with remdesivir therapy in the New England Journal, as well as um, JAMA, uh, sorry, JAMA, Lancet. Lancet had a paper come out which suggested that there was benefit to using remdesivir, although no significant mortality differences were identified. And then when they looked at the subgroup analysis from the NEJM study, younger patients with lower, with smaller, lower amount of hypoxia or severity of disease actually did a little bit better. There was really no trends to say that the severely ill patients who were getting these therapies did any better. Um, again, this is preliminary data. There's going to be some amount of longitudinal evaluation as well to see how this works. Other uh, medications that we have been using are more immunomodulator disease, such as uh, targeted IL-6, anti-IL-6 therapy such as tocilizumab, which has been shown to be used. Uh, we've used another uh, medication called ecolizumab, which again plays into the very similar inflammatory pathway of disease. So there is ongoing enrollment for all these studies here as well, and we'll see how these turn out. And um, I'm curious, do you know what is the availability or the use of remdesivir in India? Well, so we haven't yet started using it. Mm -hmm. as a restricted. So hopefully we should have a couple of centers that get permission to use it and we might be able to ship it in to use this for more patients. So, Very true. Yeah. So I'm uh, so thankful to you for doing this with me and uh, uh, it has been a great uh, session and thanks for enlightening us on the most uh, you know, varied aspects of managing COVID-19 in the ICU. Uh, to wrap this up, just let me ask me one. Uh, let me ask you one question: How do you keep yourself safe despite all this? Absolutely, you read my mind, and that's my conclusion slide. Because end of the day, there is no emergency in a pandemic like this, right? There are going to be situations where you have to rush into the room, but always pause, take a moment, make sure you have your PPE on correctly. And what does this? include. So you always make sure you have an N95 mask with good seal and good coverage. Okay. And have a full face shield, protect your eyes because these are very easy portals of entry with any sort of particulate matter that can get in. Use a full long sleeved fluid repellent gown because you are going to be doing procedures on these patients, putting in central lines, intubations. Make sure you're fully protected from that aspect and wear gloves, long cuff gloves, and ensure that you have somebody spotting you when you're putting these on, as well as when you're taking it off, because most errors interestingly occur when you're taking it off. So ensuring that you have proper donning and doffing techniques with somebody watching you is very important to make sure you stay protected. And if you don't stay protected, you can't take care of thousands of other patients that are gonna come through your hospital. 
Sure. So that's Kavita for you, a true COVID warrior and a clinical power excellence, a great academic researcher with uh, numerous researches uh, to her credit. Uh, thank you, Kavita, for uh, doing this with us. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, we are looking forward to having more fruitful discussions with you. And uh, this has been a really enlightening session for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shivata, for this opportunity. I'm really grateful and I can't wait to collaborate on more such uh, conferences. Yeah. You have a good day. Thank you, you too.